from the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios. Listen, watch, chat. This is Webcast One Live. Programs on webcastonelive.com are brought to you in part by KDC Builders. Building custom homes for how you live. KDC will take your dreams and turn them into reality. Go to our website, kdcbuilt.com, or call Hannah Inman at 515-975-9990, and Tom Coates and consumercreditofamerica.com. Are you overwhelmed with mounted credit card debt and feel there's no way out? Well, there is. Call 1-800-955-5765 for Consumer Credit of America. That's ccofamerica.com. Hi, welcome to License to Parent the School Age Years. Tonight, we're just going to talk about some topics that are um, at the top of the list for parents of kids from kindergarten to college. We're going to pick one topic at a time, and we're going to talk a little bit about it. Sometimes we do this just to brainstorm on different things that are important that come up in the news or different things that we want to talk about so that we can educate parents on ways to handle parenting better. And let me see if I can get... You there, Pat? All right. So tonight's show for school age years, we're going to just pick some random topics and talk about them. And so um, I'll go first. And that'll give you time to think of one that you want to talk about. You can talk about any topic for school age parents that you want to, something you've seen in the news, something that's been bugging you, um, whatever you'd like. Okay? Okay. Right now... I am really trying very hard not to get excited because my husband has been getting quite a few announcements from the sex offender registry lately. And it's beginning to upset and frustrate me because uh, we are very vigilant parents and I get very concerned when sex offenders move into the area. And it seems like recently we've had a few. And we've signed up for the automatic announcements, which you can do if you go to the state of Iowa sex offender registry. You can put in your address and you can search for sex offenders uh, within a designated area of your home. And so my husband and I have got a little circle within a two-mile area. So every time a sex offender moves within a two-mile area of our house, we get an announcement on our cell phone and on our computer. This can be really upsetting for two reasons. The first being that they don't give you a lot of information. They'll give you some. So for example, we recently had a sex offender move into our neighborhood just the other day who is an 18 year old boy. And it says that his victim was a girl between the ages of six and 13. Now there's a lot of room between six and 13 and I have a six year old daughter. So I obviously want to know was he sleeping with a 13-year-old that was dressed like a 20-year-old hooker? Or was he sleeping with a 6-year-old? And it doesn't tell you. And I'm, I'm feeling like the information is there, but it's not enough information to make educated choices. I wanted them to be a little more specific. Um, and I'm, I'm just feeling frustrated about the entire thing. What do you think? Um, I think you just stole my subject. But, oh, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, Are you getting a bunch of announcements too lately? No, I, I take it from another perspective. I've seen all the news on lately about all the scandals at the colleges and all the different businesses and that where these people have been abusing children. And from my point of how do parents teach their children that it's okay to tell someone when this happens? That's just a very difficult situation because they tell you all of the reasons why they don't and what the people tell them that they don't want to tell. And it seems to work year after year. And what can we do to teach our children that no matter what the person says to you, if they're inappropriately touching you, you need to tell someone. 
Well, I will say that for young children, there is an excellent program out for that. It comes from a company called Bright Music, B-R-I-T-E. So when you go to Google it, don't spell bright like you normally would. It's B-R-I-T-E. Bright Music has a series called the Safety Kids. And the Safety Kids series has a different sections in it. So there's a section about drug and alcohol safety. There's a section about uh, personal safety. There's a section about internet safety. But it's an entire series. It has coloring sheets. It has uh, wonderful music that kids love to sing. And it is a really great way to teach younger kids. Um, I always... I'm very adamant that parents teach their children the proper names for things. Don't call it a a hoo-ha or a cookie. Uh, Call it what it is. Call it a vagina. Call it a penis. Call it, you know, whatever. Give it the proper name. Because when children come to talk to you about what happened, you need to make sure that they can talk to the police and to attorneys and to judges and to everyone else about what happened without having to have a parent translation because oftentimes officials will tell you that they can't go into court with he touched my hoo-ha. And so you have to teach your kids the proper names for things because um, they may not know how to tell you if they haven't learned the proper terminology. I, I think, you know, my concern is more with the older children that are coming into the news focus now um, that are being abused by people like coaches and that, that they are taught to respect. And what is making these children not come forward when this is happening? Um, because these are not tiny little children. And, and if they've been taught when they were younger what to do, what's happening, where where is our lack and where is our, what are we doing wrong that, this is happening so much, and it's taking these children so long to come forward with it. Well, first of all, I really think that parents avoid topics like sex. They avoid topics like abuse. They avoid topics that make them uncomfortable. And so I think the way that we prevent it is by just understanding that it is a fact of life that we need to address. It's, it's very similar to, not to put anybody on the spot, but if I were a practicing Catholic and my child were an altar boy, I would be having the conversations with my child about the events going on in the news uh, when they happen and talk to him about, has anyone ever done this to you? Have you ever been touched inappropriately? Have you ever had these conversations? Um, do you ever feel like you're getting attention that's not appropriate? Because obviously I recognize that these things happen. I recognize that they've happened more than once. If I don't prepare my child and educate them to prevent it, where does that leave me? I mean, I can't just take the whole denial of, oh, our priest is wonderful. He would never do that because guess what? Every single one of them on the news for doing it, all of the parishioners said, I just don't believe it. He was so wonderful to our children. He would never do that. And so obviously our radar is not as good as we'd like to think. I will tell you something that happened um, when your sister was younger and we lived and um, I was actually sitting in the living room and your dad was actually out mowing the backyard and your sister was playing in the front yard. And the little boy across the street came running over and then I saw your dad talking to the little boy's dad and my and your sister came in the house and I said to Sherry, what is your dad talking to Sonny about? And she said, oh, don't worry, Mom, it wasn't real or he wouldn't have shown me. And what had happened was a car had pulled up in front of our house, and the man had called her over, and he had a map, and he asked her directions. And as she got to the car, he lifted the mask, the map, and he'd exposed himself to her. And the little boy across the street had seen what was going on. He was a little bit older than your sister, and he'd run over and grabbed her away from the car and went and got his parents. But we had talked to your sister in that, and yet still her belief was that this man wouldn't have shown her that if it was real. <laughs> which which is kind of a built-in defense mechanism. So, yeah, I mean, we can at least be grateful for the fact she wasn't traumatized. 
No, well, the police did take her and the little boy out, and they did put up a roadblock, and they did try to get her to identify someone, but they couldn't. But, uh, you know, children have different reactions. They don't really, you know, sometimes maybe someone's doing something inappropriate to them, and, and they don't want to really admit to themselves that this is happening. So I don't know how we defend them from that. Yeah. I often watch when I interact with children. For example, tonight I was coming into the studio to do the show, and Steve Dace is on before me, so he was doing his show, and there was a little girl in the studio. And I don't ever see kids in the studio, so I found it fascinating. She was being so quiet that they were on the air having a radio show, and nobody heard her. Sitting quietly, coloring with Sharpies, just being adorable. So I pulled some watercolors out of my little emergency entertain the kids bag and asked her if she wanted to paint. And this little girl looked at me and she didn't say a word. She just kept looking at me and looking at the paints, trying to decide if she should talk to a stranger so she could watercolor, right? Because it was a big debate in her mind. She wanted those paints so badly, but she didn't want to talk to me because she knew she wasn't supposed to. Yeah. And so I went over to my bag to get something and I saw her out of the corner of my eye. She went into the office and she talked to her mom who looked out the window and saw me and told her it was okay. And then the little girl came back out and I asked her again, do you want a watercolor? And she nodded and she smiled, right? Still not talking, but at least acknowledging, okay, you're a safe person now. I can have interaction with you. Mm -hmm. That to me was a sign that that mom, whom I've never met, the first time I've ever seen her, obviously had it together when having her child, the talk with her child about we don't talk to strangers. Because this child was smart enough to know that even though I looked like a mom, And most kids look at me and they just see a mommy. I mean, they don't even think about talking to me. It would never occur to them that I would do anything harm to them. They, they chat up a little storm. They run up and hug me. They want to sit in my lap and read a book. doesn't matter to them that I'm a complete and total stranger. This child at age four, she was four years old. She got it. And she just decided that she was going to go ask mom before she had a conversation with me. And I watched her sit in watercolor and it's kind of funny because she sat there and she's painting the most beautiful little painting and she keeps looking up and finally she said to Matt and I why are you guys looking at me (laughs) and we're like oh you're painting such a beautiful picture you're an amazing artist but it really fascinated me that she at four years old had the understanding this person is a stranger she might look safe she might even be offering me something that I really want but not to be trusted. Yeah. Whereas a lot of the kids that I see have no hesitation about running up, talking to me, hugging me. They don't even know me. And they would get in the car and leave with me in a second. They wouldn't even think twice about it. Yeah. And I think that goes back to secure relationships. And so um, there is a book called Alice by Alice Sterling Honig called Secure Relationships. And this is an older book. It was put out by NACI, which is the National Association for the Education of Young Children. They are a fantastic organization. They have an Iowa chapter as well. And what this book talks about is um, what, ha- when children feel secure, when they feel secure in their relationship with other people, and how that ends up affecting the rest of their life. Because children who don't form an attachment with their mother at a very early age, then have problems with understanding about relationships permanently. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so this book talks about ways to uh, increase the reaction or the relationship that you have with your child so that they are independent, so that they're autonomous, so that they have a high self-esteem, and so that they feel secure enough in their own self to be able to engage in relationships with others that are healthy. All right. So while we're on the topic, as long as we're talking about the sex offender registry, we're going to talk about symptoms of sexual abuse in children. You ready, Mom? Oh, uh, yeah. All right. So starts with top of the list is genital or anal pain, itching, or swelling painful urination, vaginal infections, 
Now, these can also be urinary tract or yeast infections. So once again, don't go running off to the pediatrician telling them I said your child was sexually abused. Be sure and do the research. Um, young girls, of course, I will give you the, the admonition now. If you are a mom of a young girl, no bubble baths and no harsh soaps for the vaginal area. These cause urinary tract infections and yeast infections in small children. Um, they're very, very painful and it can be avoided. If you would like to let your little girl have a bubble bath, use a feminine wash. So for example, Summer's Eve makes a feminine wash. It looks like a shower gel. You buy it in the feminine items aisle um, of your grocery store and it works great as a bubble bath but it's mild enough that it won't give them a urinary tract infection. So if they absolutely have to have the bubble bath, use that. Do not use bubble bath, especially not the harsh children's bubble baths. I mean, it just is not worth the risk. All right, next on the list, difficulty walking or sitting, discharge or odor, torn or stained underclothing, extreme changes in personality and or behaviors, Strangely sexual oriented remarks and or play. This is a big one, big one. Now it's also something they can see on television. So once again, make sure what they're watching on TV is appropriate so that if they begin discussing sex and do you want to have sex with me with the boy next door, you know, they didn't see it on BH1. Okay. Um, An obsession with sex. Fear, dislike, or avoidance of a person that they previously liked. If they have always loved the coach and spent tons of time with the coach and gone to his house and gone on trips with his family, whatever, and then all of a sudden you ask about seeing the coach and they get a look on their face like, hmm, I don't really want to, that's a big major red flag. It's time to be asking them, what do you do with the coach when you go? Okay? Okay. Uh, fears and recurrent nightmares. All of a sudden they're scared of the dark. All of a sudden they're crying in their sleep. Regression in behavior, bedwetting, thumb sucking, crying. The child tells you that they were sexually abused. Fear of bedrooms and being alone or a fear of bathrooms. We're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, I am going to tell you about a personal experience that I have had with this topic and the signs that I didn't see that I wish I had seen from the very beginning. And then we're going to talk about incest, which is another terrible topic nobody wants to talk about. So we're going to deal with it. We'll be back in a few. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Well, hi, I'm Rob Spearman. I'm a broker owner of Remax Real Estate Concepts in Des Moines, Iowa. Give us a call if you're looking at buying or selling a home, or if you're having trouble on your mortgage payments or looking to purchase foreclosures, we have the agents to help you, experienced, outstanding agents. Our office number is 515-276-2872. Or if you'd like to look at homes, go to our website, homeconnectusa.com. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Save us! Help! Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! Hi, I'm Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. Hooray! We're saved! Consumer Credit! You're the more hero! From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios. Listen. Watch. Chat. This is Webcast One Live. Programs on webcastonelive.com are brought to you in part by KDC Builders. Building custom homes for how you live. KDC will take your dreams and turn them into reality. Go to our website, kdcbuilt.com, or call Hannah Inman at 515-975-9990, and Tom Coates and ConsumerCreditOfAmerica.com. Are you overwhelmed with mounted credit card debt and feel there's no way out? 
Well, there is. Call 1-800-955-5765 for Consumer Credit of America. That's ccofamerica.com. Welcome back. We decided to just pick some topics and talk about tonight, and somehow we ended up on the icky topic of sexual abuse, which is something that can't be talked about enough, considering everything that we've seen in the news recently. Um, right now, we are going to talk about um, an experience that I had. Um, my oldest daughter, when she was very small, I took her to my girlfriend's house for daycare. And I was working at the time doing accounting for my friend's husband's company. And my girlfriend said, oh, I would love to watch her for you. Um, I'll give you a really great rate. And she was watching about three other children at the time. And I had known her for a while. She was a good friend. She was a very responsible person. And she had a daughter my daughter's age. And so I took my daughter to her for child care. It turns out that my girlfriend was leaving my daughter and her daughter with her dad while she would go to dentist appointments, go out to lunch with friends, go to run errands. And her dad seemed like a very nice man, but I was unaware of the fact that my daughter was being left with him because it never came up in conversation. And it should have because I should have asked her, you know, when you're running these errands, she would mention to me, hey, I ran some errands today, blah, 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 or I went to the dentist today. It did not occur to me to ask her, who did you leave my child with? Because I guess in the back of my mind, I thought that my child went with her, and that wasn't the case. So anyway, my daughter, who was very well-spoken, had an incredible vocabulary, was exceptionally bright, was just barely three. And all of a sudden, after being potty trained for more than a year, not having had an accident in over a year, even at bedtime, in underwear, everything was going great, all of a sudden my daughter started wetting herself. And she started waking up in the middle of the night screaming, just screaming. So we went to the pediatrician, you know, he said night terrors, said not to worry anything about it. And I didn't express any inkling to him that I thought that there was any kind of abuse going on. I just thought she was having nightmares. So a few more weeks went on and my daughter started acting very strange about going to the bathroom. She would not go to the bathroom in public bathroom. She would hold it and she would hold it until she wet herself because she did not want to go in any bathrooms where the toilet was blue or any kind of color. My in-laws took her for a weekend to their cabin up in the mountains in Colorado and they had treated the toilet over the winter with antifreeze. And she wet herself all weekend. And every time they would try to take her to the bathroom, she screamed her head off. So she got home. And of course, we don't use any blue in our toilets. And so she came in and she was going to the bathroom just fine. And everything was kind of going back to normal. And she went in one day to go to the bathroom. And I went in to wipe her. And my daughter ran screaming, screaming, don't touch my bum. Don't touch my bum. And she hid from me in the closet. Then the light's on. Your child's hiding from you in the closet, screaming at you, don't touch their bum. There's no other conclusion to make than something is seriously going wrong, and we have to go right now to the doctor. So I took my daughter to the pediatrician, told him all of the signs and symptoms. He then referred me to a specialist who sat down with my daughter and did a full exam and talked with my daughter and referred us to a child psychologist. And... Um, then it was his fun job to break the news to me that my daughter had been molested. And luckily, we caught it before um, he had had intercourse with her. It had simply been that he had been uh, using his fingers and touching her inappropriately and rubbing her, which is what had caused a redness and an irritation that made her not want to go to the bathroom and not want to be wiped. And... It was six more months of nightmares and screaming and wetting herself. I withdrew from all of my college courses because I couldn't stand to leave her. It was too hard to go anywhere. Couldn't trust anyone to watch her. And that was the last time that I trusted my daughter in daycare. From then on, I did daycare. 
so that I did not have to worry about where she was or who she was with. And that's kind of how I ended up in such a long-term career raising other people's children is because I got it how important it is. I got it the worst possible thing that can go wrong and didn't ever want to have to live through it again. So you have to be open with your kids. You have to talk to your kids. It's not a fun conversation, I know. It's not fun to say to your children, someday somebody that you really love might hurt you. Somebody, somebody that you really love might do something that you know is wrong and ask you to keep it a secret. And I know you love them, but I want you to not keep it a secret. And I want you to know that whatever you tell me, then we'll deal with it together. And I will never be ashamed of you and I'll never be disappointed in you. And I am a strong mommy. And if that person tells you that they're going to hurt me or they're going to hurt daddy, you need to understand that we are strong parents that nobody will hurt us, and that we will always take care of you. And you got to start having that conversation when they're little, really little. Because at age three, here I was at the police station with my daughter talking about this and talking about the results from the doctor. And you know what they said? She's too young to make a reliable witness. She doesn't even know the proper terms. There you go. So I'm telling you now, teach your children the proper names, talk to them about it, talk to them, talk to them, talk to them, talk to them, talk to them about it. And get the Safety Kids from Bright Music because it really is an amazing program. And no, I don't sell it. So, But go on their website, Google it. Um, Janine Brady is the woman who started it. She, she is Mormon. I'll give you that one. But that's not why I like her. It's just a really great program. All right, Mom. Anything else you want to cover on sexual abuse? Want to talk about the babysitter I had when I was a kid? Uh Uh-oh, hold on. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I can (laughs) hear you, yeah. Um, I thought I had you on the air and I didn't. So now you want to talk about the babysitter that I had when I was a kid. I think we talked about this once when we were talking about babysitters, how we had this really, really good babysitter, and when we called for her, she couldn't come, so her mother sent a foster brother um, who taught you how to French kiss. Yes, he did. And how old was I at the time? Uh, Let's see, you couldn't have been over three or four. Yep. And luckily for me, that was the one and only time. And you know, luckily for me, you, my mother's intuition kicked in because we were actually out of dinner and I had this ugly gut feeling that I needed to go home. So we actually left the dinner early yep. and came home, you know, so, um, yeah. And I don't really have much of a recollection of that, but I was pretty little, so. No, but the point is, you know, these babysitters, people that you leave your children with, just like you're talking about, you have to be so careful. Well, so careful. that brings me to the great part. I am one of those people that is technologically retarded. Oh, sorry. That's not the politically correct word to use. I'm technologically illiterate. Is that better? Challenged. Challenged. Whatever you want to call it. Better choice. Okay. But I am smart enough to know that there are a lot of resources that you can use. So I'm going to give you the tips for advice. First of all, if you're going to hire babysitters, you need to generate a pool of two or three really great babysitters and do background checks on them. And what I mean by that is you need to check the sex offender registry, check for a child abuse or criminal history, fingerprint them, which you can do and you can get the results back. Make sure that they are fit to watch your children. But that doesn't cover teenagers like the person that we hired that time uh, that taught you to bridge kiss. He was a teenager. So Nowadays, mother, it still would because believe it or not, just like this 18-year-old who just moved into my neighborhood, there are teenage pedophiles. There are yep. teenage sex abusers who have a record, even as a juvenile, for sex abuse. There can be a lot of um, really bad choices out there who do not have a record. So you need to do further than... Just check a sex abuse registry. Yeah. I think, you know, I think you have to know who you're leaving your child with. Well, and I am like a great advocate for the nanny cam. I think that whoever invented the teddy bear with the camera in it, genius. I mean, look at all the things we're seeing now. Just saw on the news the other night about a woman who was literally kicking a little baby 
that was trying to crawl up to her to get to her and was crying. And this woman put her foot in the kid's face and kicked it back onto the floor. And the parents recorded it all and it was on the news. Cool. How awful is that? Well, it's good that, I mean, I think you're right. I think the nanny cams, I think there's nothing wrong. I would have absolutely no problem whatsoever of there being a camera in my daycare to show parents what I do with their children. Absolutely none. Yeah. Um, another thing that you need to make sure that you do is if your child comes to you with an allegation, and I don't care who that allegation is about, I don't care if they are accusing your husband, your brother, their coach, their teacher, their pastor, somebody that you have known all your life and think is the most wonderful person in the free world. Do not look your child in the eye and tell them you don't believe them. Don't do it. You know, the sad part of that is I have friends who have told me that they were abused as children and they have told their mother and their mother has sided with the abuser. That to me is like so sad. Oh, as a foster parent, I have watched parents, literally, DHS will come in and say, we have evidence and proof that your boyfriend has been abusing your daughter. And the mom says, get that little slut out of here. She tempted him. It's all her fault. And I would end up with teenage foster children who were there because mom chose the boyfriend. Or in one case, I ended up with a teenage mom who the uncle was the dad. Uh-huh. And so here she is at my house raising her baby and the mom doesn't want to have anything to do with her because she's a little slut. It's unbelievable to me that people can throw away their children for a boyfriend. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the the choices yeah. that parents are making now really, really scare me. But they say a lot about how the the whole thing started in the first place. So... um When your child comes to you with an allegation, it's very, very important, first of all, that you set aside whatever. If you have a meeting you have to go to, reschedule it. If you have plans to go to dinner, reschedule. Take your child somewhere where you can sit that is not intimidating, that is not crowded in public, that is a place where both of you are happy and comfortable and serene. Sit down with your child, clear everything else out of your head, And tell your child, I just want you to tell me everything from the beginning. Tell me when it started and just tell me everything that you feel comfortable telling me. And know that I am not going to be angry and I'm not going to judge you and that I will help you. And I want to understand and let them talk. And the one big mistake that parents make is instantly they escalate. If you get angry and start screaming and cussing, that son of a gun, I'm going to kill his butt. I'm going to go to the cops and throw his butt in jail. The only thing that's going to do is alarm your child and make them upset, especially if it is someone that they love and care about. If you start talking about throwing grandpa in jail, you're not going to help the situation with your child. So all those hateful, angry thoughts going through your head, they're justified. I'll give them to you. And if you want to do it later when your kid is not looking and you want to go shoot him, I will be the first person to applaud. But while you're in front of your child, you have to simply listen, be sympathetic, keep it under control, and pay attention to what your child needs. They need to talk about it. They need to get it out to feel like they've told someone and to feel like somebody is actually listening because so many times children will come and disclose to the person that they trust and that person will shut down, remove themselves or express disbelief. And once you do that, you've lost it. I mean, it's over then. All right. We're going to take our last commercial break for the evening and we'll be right back in just a few minutes to talk some more about this icky topic. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Well, hi, I'm Rob Spearman. I'm a broker owner of REMAX Real Estate Concepts in Des Moines, Iowa. Give us a call if you're looking at buying or selling a home, or if you're having trouble on your mortgage payments or looking to purchase foreclosures, we have the agents to help you, experienced, outstanding agents. Our office number is 515-276-2872. Or if you'd like to look at homes, 
go to our website, homeconnectusa.com. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Save us! Help! Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! Hi, I'm Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. Hooray! We're saved! From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios. Listen. Watch. Chat. This is Webcast One Live. Programs on webcast1live.com are brought to you in part by KDC Builders. Building custom homes for how you live. KDC will take your dreams and turn them into reality. Go to our website, kdcbuilt.com, or call Hannah Inman at 515-975-9990. And Tom Coates and ConsumerCreditOfAmerica.com. Are you overwhelmed with mounted credit card debt and feel there's no way out? Well, there is. Call 1-800-955-5765 for Consumer Credit of America. That's ccofamerica.com. Welcome back. So tonight we're talking about sex offender registries and sexual abuse. And there is a book that is called uh, How to Detect and Prevent Child Abuse. It is a wonderful book full of tips. And I'm going to read you some of the tips now about how to allow your child, a younger child, to express um, the things that have happened and how they're feeling if they're not ready to talk about it. Obviously, you're going to want to get your child therapy, okay? I would never say that you can replace a therapist when it comes to this. You're going to want to seek professional help. However, there are some things that you can do to get your st child started getting ready to talk about it before you ever get to a therapist. Because in a lot of cases, especially with certain kinds of insurance, like military insurance or Title 19, there's an extreme shortage of child psychologists and psychiatrists, and therefore you can wait weeks for an appointment. So um, these are some tips and techniques I'm going to read to you that you can use to get them started expressing themselves. And what you'll want to do is save these. So when you're doing these things with your child and they're making these these projects, you want to save them and put them in an envelope for the therapist, write the date that they were done and what you were talking about when it happened, and then put them in the envelope so that the therapist can then have a look at them. The first one is to have a dollhouse. A dollhouse is a great way for kids to express what is happening in their homes. It's also plain fun for kids, whether or not they're being abused. Having furniture in your dollhouse and a mom, dad, brother, and sister, maybe even a dog and a cat. Only one child at a time can play with a dollhouse if you're talking about a therapy situation. So if you're wanting your child to express what's going on in their life, putting them in with other children who are going to try and express what's going on in their life will not give you a clear picture. So what you want to do is sit down with your child, pretend you're watching something else, pretend you're watching the news, pretend you're reading a book so that they don't feel like you're staring at them. And then you may want to have a recorder sitting someplace where they can't see it, recording it for later on so that you can sit and look at it um, straight on when you have a moment and they're not in the room so that you're not staring at them. That way you can actually look at the book and let the camcorder catch it and then watch it later. But what you want to do is put the dollhouse down with all of the dolls and let them play and see what they do and see who in the dollhouse is doing what. So if you have an inkling about where your child, who might be responsible, you can put a doll that represents that person into the house. You can put a doll that represents lots of different people into the house if you don't have any idea and just see who comes out. And if you see your child playing with a doll that is acting inappropriately and you don't know who that doll is, it's okay 
to ask your child after they're done playing, who are each of the dolls? Don't ask them right when it's happening because then they'll know you're watching. They'll wait a little while and a little bit later on, come over and go, wow, can I play with you? And who is this? Oh, and that's daddy. That's wonderful. And who is this? Oh, that's coach Tommy. Okay. And make a mental note so that when you go back and watch the video later, you can see which doll your child is responding to in a negative way and, and talking about as a predator or making actions like the doll is a predator so that you can see which doll is enacting the abuse. Um, you can have a real telephone that is not hooked up. Children do not tend to like to play with play phones. Um, even in daycare, I go to Best Buy and I get their uh, display phones for my daycare. They give them to you free. They're super cool about it. And you can take these cell phones home and they, they look exactly like yours. They just don't have the inside guts. So your child can talk on them all day long and they can have an iPhone or a flip phone or whatever kind of phone and they can talk and talk and talk. Children will talk about things on a phone to an imaginary person, believe it or not. Um, they will take that phone and they'll yammer, 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 yammer. You'll say, who are you talking to? I'm talking to Sethy. And that's Casey's little boyfriend, by the way, Sethy. And she loves him. And so she will talk for an hour on the phone to Sethy. He's not really on the other end. But she'll tell him what she did that day. She'll tell him what her butterfly she painted looks like. She'll tell him what mommy's been doing. She'll tell him where we're going to go on the weekend. All these things just come spewing out of her mouth because it's her way of expressing. And so you can have a phone that is not hooked up, a real telephone or a pretend cell phone, and just let them pretend to call and talk, especially if your child is acting angry. If your child is acting angry or upset with someone, what you can do is say, sometimes it helps me when I'm angry or upset to call that person and tell them why I'm angry. How about if I give you the phone and I'll go over here and read my book and you can call and tell them why you're upset. You can call and tell them what you're angry about and what you don't like. Then you give them the phone, go a little ways away, put your face into the book. And even when you hear them saying things that completely shock you and make you upset, don't put down the book and go, oh, what did you say? Did he say that to you? Did he do that? Just keep your face in the book and let your child talk until they're done. Let them get it all out. Let them talk to that person. Tell them what they think. Then if you don't know who the person is, if they don't say their name, after they're all done talking, wait a little while and say to them, well, did you have a good conversation? Oh, you did? Wow. And who is that you were talking with? Oh, okay. I get it. Make it casual, make it unimportant, like you didn't even hear the conversation. Because if you go, who was it that was hurting you? I heard you talking on the phone. Then you escalate, then they escalate. Then they're upset and anxious, then they're not going to tell you anything. Okay? Keep it light. Throughout this whole process, you're going to want to scream. You're going to want to throw things. You're going to want to call people on the phone right in front of your child. You're going to want to call the cops into your house and make a big to-do you will create so much anxiety in your child, you will defeat the purpose. Stop, take a breath, be calm, be supportive, be there, and just wait for your child to be ready. You want to add anything to this? No. No? All right. Have a book of art activities that help a child to express himself or herself. Very important to have several colors of crayons. Don't just give them a little box of four crayons, red, green, yellow, and blue. Make sure that they have a spectrum. Children who are depressed or angry will use different colors to express depressed or angry. They will also use red for blood. They will also use blue for tears. So give your children the tools, the crayons and the colors to talk about when they got hurt, to talk about how they felt. Give them the power to communicate with you without having to sit down and tell you things that they're not supposed to tell you because they're a secret. Because children don't equate what they draw with what they're not supposed to tell. So they might draw the entire story on paper for you without ever realizing that they're telling you what they're not supposed to tell you. And maybe that's their subconscious way of doing it without defying the person who's hurting them. I think that's excellent because a lot of times 
children will draw pictures expressing things that have happened or, or family or feelings or that. Um, that's a great way to, to deal with it. Well, and there are little subtle signs that therapists can pick out. For example, if a child is feeling like they don't have any communication, they will literally draw themselves with no mouth. Or if they feel like everyone else is above them, they will draw themselves as much smaller. So you'll see these people in huge scale, and then you'll see this little tiny person with no mouth, and you'll ask the child, who is this? And they'll say, that's me. And that means that they don't feel that they have a significant place in the group. Like they feel that they are not important as compared to all of the other large lifelike individuals. On, on a little bit lighter note, I'll just share this. I had an art teacher come today for an hour and work with my children, and she helped them to draw a turkey. And I have a little girl in my daycare who is extremely bright, and her mother came to get her tonight, and we made these pictures into placemats for them for Thanksgiving. So she showed her mother the placemat and told about drawing the turkey, and she said to her mother, but my turkey only has one eye. Come again? Because they'd drawn the side view of the turkey. Oh. And she's like, but my turkey only had one eye. <laughs> well, and she's obviously learned empathy because she feels sorry for the turkey. Hey, Matt, put that picture up for one more second. So this picture is exactly what I am talking about. That is Casey Allison. She is my youngest of eight. And that is a display cell phone from Best Buy that I got for free that has provided hours and hours and hours of entertainment that you can't buy with any amount of money. And she was on that phone in front of a backdrop because my husband does photography work. She was in front of the backdrop and she was talking to Sefi. And she was talking about when do we get to have a play date and I want to come and play at your house because Sethy got a new house and she was very excited. So yeah, that is exactly what I'm talking about. Children will talk about things to a teddy bear. They'll talk on a play phone. They'll talk to their animals. Sometimes all you have to do is tell your child, you had a really hard day why don't you go tell Muffin about your really hard day? And Muffin might be their teddy bear. Muffin might be the household dog. But they might sit on the porch with the dog and tell the dog all kinds of things they're not going to tell you. As long as you get it recorded or you can hear it, you're still getting the information. And that way you don't have to pry from them. You don't have to make them talk about things they don't want to talk about. They can talk about it to somebody they think will keep their secret and you can find out what you need to know without putting them on the spot. Next, open-ended stories. Open-ended stories are a fantastic way all the time to find out how your kids are feeling. Not just in cases of abuse, but if you have a child that you feel has started acting differently and you're not sure why and you feel like they're sad or they're emotionally unattached or they're anxious or angry, with a younger child, open-ended stories are great. Clear up until about age seven or eight. After that, your kids get to be a little bit smarter and they they get onto you and they realize what you're doing. But what you can do with an open-ended story is you can start the story for your child. And you can say, once upon a time, there was a little princess. And this princess's name was Casey. And Casey was a wonderful little girl and her family loved her so much. And they always had lots and lots of fun and they went to the park and they went to the pool. But one day, Casey just got really sad. And the reason she was sad was, and then you go, okay, you tell the story and let her pick up. And then Casey says, oh, she was really sad because... Her sister got to go to a birthday party and she didn't get to go and nobody invited her to their birthday. There you go. Have the answer. Might not be the drama you expected and you'll be relieved, but then you have the answer without saying to your kid, what are you so upset about? In which case they're going to look at you and go, nothing, <laughs> nothing. Okay. So these are techniques that therapists use all the time. Okay, 
You can, if your child is angry, you can give them a punching bag. You can give them pillows to punch. You can have a pillow fight with them and break them out of the anger. Let them pound on you all they want. You can make bread dough. Literally, one of the best ways to resolve a kid's anger is to mix up some bread dough in the KitchenAid, give it to them, and tell them it's your turn to knead. Here's how you do it. And after 20 minutes of kneading that bread dough, not only will their arms hurt, but they'll have expended all the angry energy they had, and they'll be ready to move on to something more productive. You can mix Play-Doh. You can mix cookie dough. Anything that requires a lot of arm and hand movements to let them get control. If your child is feeling angry and they have to go to school and you're concerned that it might be a problem, you can give them a stress ball. You can give them a stress ball, a rubber ball that they can squeeze when they start to feel irritated, that they can put pressure on to relieve the pressure in their brain and the pressure in their body. This helps them to keep control and have appropriate behaviors, and it helps them to express the energy so that they then feel calm and ready to deal with whatever it is that made them angry in the first place. All right, Mom. Hey. Any other topics? Because we got a few minutes left. What you want to talk about? Um, we we're talking about children from school age and up. Yes, okay. ages six to adulthood. All right. Well, I had a discussion today with one of my mothers who's concerned because her son doesn't tie his shoes. And I informed her that I have two children in my daycare who are in second grade, fourth grade, in accelerated classes who do not know how to tie their shoes because children no longer tie their shoes. They use Velcro. And the reason the subject came up was because the little boy was having trouble zipping his jacket. And I hate those winter jackets because they're very difficult. And I said, I'll be really glad when somebody invents something to close jackets like they have shoes so you don't have to deal with these. And then we went on to talk about the fact that these children also cannot tell time except on a digital clock. So one of my concerns is that somewhere in our system, we're losing some of these skills that really are life skills that we really still need to learn. Well... I'm with you about the shoe tying because 90% of shoes now are Velcro. And even the ones that look like you tie them, most of the time now you don't really tie them. It's fake laces and they stretch and you can stick your foot in them. So they don't even actually tie. But you have to tie bows and other things. And it's just a skill in life that I feel like we're really depriving our children of not teaching them these skills. Oh, I'm not in disagreement with you. And even worse than the shoe tying or the jacket zipping, let's talk about the new math that teaches kids how to cheat through a problem and not show their work. What happened to showing your work? You know? I don't know. I had to show my work. You had to show your work. The teacher had to see that we knew how to get to the end result. Even now they're showing kids how to cheat their way to the end result and not worry about the actual process and the actual work. And even reading now has become uh, teach your baby to read, monkey see, monkey do. See the word clap, we clap. That's reading. It's not reading. You're seeing the word clap and you're recognizing the word clap. You're not reading the word clap. There's no phonics involved. And as a result, they turn into adults who are illiterate imbeciles who only recognize the words that they saw in your baby can read. And the schools are now doing away with handwriting. Oh, oh man, you should not have brought that up. We don't have, we don't even have time left in the show to get into how I feel about the handwriting thing. And all of you parents out there, teach your children cursive. Teach your children cursive. Absolutely. How do you sign your signature when you grow up? Heck with that. What happens if that child ends up needing to fit in in an upper level echelon of society? Yep. Things like handwritten thank you letters, handwritten invitations. These are art forms for educated people. If you want your child to be able to compete with educated people, they have to be educated. Cursive is a very important skill. I don't care if you think it's outdated. The very rich do not feel it's outdated. The, the royalty in England doesn't feel it's outdated. If you want your child to be able to be successful in every level of society, 
then you need to teach them the skills that only the upper crust have, that only the higher levels of society that can afford the very best private schools learn. Teach them how to write a beautifully written thank you letter or even a beautifully written love letter. Maybe we should cover this subject on another whole night. Oh, yeah. (laughs) We'll have a night about handwriting. Amongst other things, we'll have a... else that we aren't teaching our children that it's a great loss, you know? There's just so many that that technology is taken away from us. Yeah. Don't teach me to write, just give me a computer to sit in front of. Yep. Oh, my God. Power of the Internet. It's killing me. Yeah. All right. So, uh, we're going to call it a night for tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us for License to Parent the School Age Years. As usual, it's been a ball talking with everybody. Mom... I'm glad you hung around for a second hour. I know you're going to hit the rack now, so I will talk to you tomorrow morning. Be sure to, because I have some things I need to tell you. Oh, my gosh, hot gossip. Oh, well, maybe now now I'll have to call and wake you on my way home. Call me on the way home. (laughs) All right. Bye, Mom. Bye. (laughs) And for the rest of you, have a great night, and uh, see you again next week. Bye-bye. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Well, hi, I'm Rob Spearman. I'm a broker owner of REMAX Real Estate Concepts in Des Moines, Iowa. Give us a call if you're looking at buying or selling a home. 